Uh, Giuliano Testa. Giuliano is the surgical director of uh, living donor liver transplant at Baylor University Medical Center. Um, he was here for a number of years. I had the great opportunity to work with him as a colleague, and uh, great to welcome you back, Giuliano. Thank you. Um, but first of all, Mark, thank you so much for the invitation. And it's one of my, the highlight of my uh, otherwise insignificant career to be part of the McLean uh, family and to have trained with you. So this is really, really deeply appreciated. Um, I feel better because usually uh, in the past I've been the one who has presented a little bit of uh, controversial issues. So thank you guys for starting with this. That, <laughs> that makes everything else very, very easy. Um, we are not thinking about transplanting anything that you may have related in your mind, especially to the male mind, to cosmetic surgery. So that's not the issue of this, what we're discussing today. What um, the, the premise for whoever doesn't know where my ethical uh, training has brought me is trying to um, understand from the guy on the field, because I'm a transplant surgeon and I will always be a transplant surgeon, what are the issues that have to do with my profession and, and also try sometimes to counteract uh, other uh, great ethicists that speak about transplant but don't leave the profession like I do. So there is a little bit of bias in anything that I say and I do about uh, my profession. And uh, one of the things that you may not be aware of or you heard a lot is that the premise to everything that we speak about ethics in transplant is a, is a simple uh, demand and offer. There is, there is a huge gap there, and we can't fill it. And no matter how much I study about that and no matter how much I read about that, the gap is there. And there is really no big solution to that. Uh, with all the beautiful articles that have been written and how we should do this and that, if you look at the curve of the donors in the United States coming from a disease source, that curve, that number, has been steady and unchanged for the past probably 10 to 12 years. And so if you think about, OK, well, let's do something. What out there that can be replaced, there is nothing that will replace. At least now we are talking, when I was a fellow, we were talking about doing a, a xenotransplantation, using animals' organs for humans. Well, I, they, I, I was told at that time that was around the corner. And that was 20 years ago. So it's not materialized at all. And I strongly believe that it will not really be materialized in the next 10 years. So the next one is going to be scaffolding, which is using stem cells and growing organs and then putting them in an already pre-framed uh, collagen, uh, um, let's say, structure that will allow then the cells to grow and perform the action and function of the organs we are trying to replace. And that is also around the corner, only that the corner is probably five or ten years away. So for the next ten years, we are stuck with this issue. And everything I think about when I think about ethics in transplantation is how we can do it uh, in a way that's uh, it's good for everybody. And the reality is that the only source that we have that we can use is living donors. You can go around this as much as you want is living donors. The, the alternative would be to say that we stop put, uh, placing patients on the list. And that would cause a little bit of ethical dilemma too. Because once you open the door to the 70 year old to get the kidney transplant or a liver transplant or a heart transplant, I think Dick Cheney was close to his 70 when he got his heart transplant, it's hard to start saying, okay, let's put barriers. Let's say that certain people get the transplant, certain people get not the transplant, so the supply and the demand will equal. You can do that. And even if you start to do that, then you have a problem of how ethically justify something like that. So the bottom line, all this introduction is based on the fact that living donor seems to be the only options we have. And then from my point of view is how can we um, somewhat make sure that we understand, that given the premise, how can we, we can work with, with the living donors and make them the, the source that they could be. And in my opinion, this has been an evolution in my thinking is that in the beginning I thought that living donors should be a second choice to uh, diseased donors. And the more I work in this field and the more I understand in reality should be the opposite. That the living donor should be the first choice and disease donors should be the second choice. And although this seems very radical, the bottom line is we are the only profession in medicine that routinely offer a lesser quality treatment when another one is available. Because there is no disease organ that can be 
compatible in function and duration to a living organ donor. So this is a very intriguing point if you think about a little bit about that. And then we are also the only profession, uh, the only section of medicine that tells a patient that you have a problem, this is the treatment, get in line. It's very strange for a society that is used to have everything right away, well done, in a perfect fashion, and possibly at the top of the line. So this is the conundrum, this is the, this is the, the problem we live on. So having said that, um, this is uh, what we have. I, I thought, how can we make living donor uh, more, let me use this bad term, palatable to the uh, professionals and the people who think that living donor is not a good choice, it shouldn't be the first choice. And it takes a lot of work around that. But I thought, why, for example, there are other things we do in medicine that are fairly accepted by everybody? And nobody has really any problem with it. And then when we start touching upon living donors, any sort of ethical concern comes about. And that has always been a very inter interesting question for me. So I thought about cosmetic surgery because cosmetic surgery is performed everywhere. When I trained in the University of Chicago, we didn't do cosmetic surgery. Now, cosmetic surgery is part of uh, the activity, regular activity, daily activity of the Department of University uh, Hospital like University of Chicago. It's not only the, the small uh, plastic surgeon out there that does cosmetic surgery. So it's accepted by everybody. And yet, this is a, an example in my opinion, and it could be also the one of the surrogate mother, where somebody doesn't need the treatment but gets the treatment, unless we believe that by becoming a cosmetic surgery patient, you live longer, or something as happens to you. Anyway, the difference that I saw is that while in cosmetic surgery there is absolute autonomy, and I think very few could probably argue with this point, we are extremely paternalistic, uh, me included, in approaching the living donation process and the living donors. Um, so what is the, the, the problem with this? The problem is exactly going back to what I tried to say before. The problem is that by approaching the living donation with this premise, in a certain way, we use it in a terms in, in a, as, as a deterrent, and we decrease the potential number of patients, that, the donors, not patients, the human beings that would like to step forward and become living donors. Um, so the problem may be, well, are you sure that we are being paternalistic when we approach living donation? Well, I live this every day, and I think we are. Um, I don't think there is probably any article on living donation, aside probably a couple of them, and one of them we were reading remark, that um, doesn't think that the donor is a vulnerable person. It's, it's just in the mind of everybody. It's, it's a diffuse feeling that we have to think about as a, a vulnerable uh, person, to the point that the donor has to have an advocate. There is no other specialty medicine where you go to the doctor with an advocate, but we do that for living donation. And then we know that the donor must be protected from coercion. And, uh, and coercion is always the big word. As soon as you talk about living donation, the first reaction is coercion. And I can tell you that in the Western world, there are different connotations of coercion, but it's not as, uh, as present, as daily seen as, as you may think. And, and then there is also this approach that we have to protect the donor from his own desires and from his own action. And it's our job as physicians to do that which is, some, is probably the, the epitome of, of paternalism. And, um, and then we scrutinize them. We scrutinize them in a way that's extremely personal. We go into their uh, financial planning, their, their, they have insurance plan, uh, in their behaviors, and with that, then we get in trouble of ourselves because we have to disclose eventually that the donor, for example, has practices that may harm the recipient. So this is, this, is, this is another ethical problem that we get ourselves into. Um, so how are they similar, cosmetic surgery and living donation? Um, neither patient really need the surgery. Um, there is no curative intent, as far as we know, at least for the person involved themselves in the surgery. But both of them may have a great deal of fulfillment. I think that whoever has worked with living donation knows that the donor usually is an incredible uh, fulfillment by being a donor. Um, both of these surgeries have uh, potential uh, dangerous consequences, even lifelong or the life itself. And there may be an inner pressure in, in both uh, for different reasons, of course. Uh, the, the living donor because of family issues maybe, or the, um, the cosmetic surgery patient because uh, she feels that she has to do something in order to be better accepted by society. Um, 
how are they different then? If that's the premise, they have all these similarities. How are these two uh, procedures different? Uh, well, the attitude is completely different. The attitude is that um, the living donor is considered vulnerable and the cosmetic surgery patient is not. Because otherwise, you would have another circus of uh, physicians and uh, donor advocates, also and, uh, cosmetic surgery advocates, also for this uh, part of the, uh, of the patient population. The premium non ulcerative concept is always evoked when we think about living donation. There are plenty of articles out there where, in the, in the introduction, premium non ulcerative comes up as the, like we're doing something of which we should be ashamed. Um, and then the donor is, as I said, assigned a, a, a donor advocate, which uh, serves to protect eventually the donor. Um, there is a very, very lengthy social uh, screening. Um, and behavioral screening. And I never understood whether this is done to protect the donor or at the end of the day to protect the recipient because the two things sometimes kind of mingle. And then the motivation. This is something that I feel uh, strongly about. We always question the motivation of the living donor, always. And if by any chance the motivation of the living donor is not what we, either by society or by, because we are physicians, accept, then very often this donor is, oh, this guy doesn't have it. This guy is going to get in trouble. This guy um, has some secondary uh, intent. And then we, of course, deny a donation because that happens. Th those are very good reasons for denying donation. And then we offer them a cooling off period, which is like to say, are you really sure you want to do that? But we, I don't think we offer any cool enough pe uh, um, period to anybody who wants to have cosmetic surgery, for example. In conclusion, um, I think we should have a little bit of um, uh, thought about this. There is, should be a greater respect for the donor. Uh, I would advocate for a more balanced approach between the risks and the benefit, not denying the risk, but also not putting them in front and telling what the benefit of being a donor here. I would like to create a culture of living donation, like we, in a certain way, we create a culture of beauty with cosmetic surgery. So instead of now ever, have you ever heard about a national campaign advocating living donation? Never happened. Why not? When this should be really a good option for many, many patients. And at the end, I believe everybody uh, will benefit. Thank you for your attention. Right on time.